So this is finding your service delivery manager. And you may notice the subtitle question, the scary question of who's responsible here. So I'm not sure what your experience is, but if each time I walk into an organization and ask that question, so who's, who's responsible for delivery here? You get a whole variety of responses. Sometimes, uh, you know, from puzzling, pass, puzzling looks to, um, you know, un uncomfortable looks to you know, fear and things like that. So wh why is it? So we're going to try to explore that a little. So my name is Fernando Cuenca. I am from Canada. I am part of a group of consultants and coaches. We call ourselves Squirrel North. So you will find three of the squirrels here. The fourth is we left it in the north. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in knowing more about us, you can always go to our website or talk to us later. We'll be happy to tell you about us. So I thought we could start this by asking first the question of why is this important to begin with? So why, why bother talking about the service delivery manager and, or the service delivery manager role and how to find it? And uh, well, so I'm going to guess that by now everybody is at least somehow aware of the KMM. And uh, roughly speaking, you know that the KMM is dividing maturity, the maturity space in two, in two big areas, the unfit area and the, and the fit area. And that, uh, you know, the unfit area is mostly about managing individuals and teams, whereas the fit area is about managing services and ecosystems of services. Right? Now, um, we also know that most of the market is somewhere around there. And we know that we want the market to be somewhere here. So there is some evolution that needs to happen, right? Now, if you have attended any of the KMN training class or read the KMN book or have any exposure to the material, you might have heard about very well-known um, barriers to moving from level to level to level. And the important one I'd like to, to focus on right now is this one. The, the, this, are, this is a summary of the barriers to move from level one to level two. So if, you were at, if you're at level one and you need to get somehow to level three or four, you need to pass through level two first, right? <laughs> well, these are the barriers you will find. And in particular, I'd like to call your attention to this one. So this is one of the most common barriers I see or we tend to see in organizations that are stuck at level one and they cannot get out and it's about the absence of someone who takes responsibility for a service. So that's a major, it's a major barrier to maturity evolution. Right? So that's, that's the reason why I think the topic of the service delivery manager is so important. Now, um, what's responsibility then? So what do we mean by taking responsibility? So who is, who is familiar with the work of Christopher Avery? So, um, you can find more about his work and that URL. He has a full model to explain how responsibility works and what is and what isn't. Um, and you, you may agree or not with uh, his take, but I just wanted to make you aware of what's the lens I'm going to be taking in the rest of the, conver of the presentation as I'm talking about maturity. So um, one of the things that I, I found interesting in the work, the way that Christopher um, explains all this or, or explains the, the problem of responsibility is that he starts by observing that we tend to think of responsibility as you know, doing the right thing. Usually it's something we don't want to do, right? Or uh, taking blame. So there is lots of a blame game going around when we ask about who's responsible here. And that explains some of the reactions you probably get. And his observation is that, well, that's not really what responsibility is about. Responsibility is about something else, things like this. It's about taking ownership, it's owning something owning your actions and all the ramifications and implications and, 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 and the fallout of your actions. And it's being a choice. So responsibility is something you choose. It's not something that somebody imposes on you. I cannot make you responsible of anything. You need to choose to be responsible. And uh, now that's, there's something else we sometimes talk about is accountability. So the difference between the two in this model is that accountability is an expectation of responsibility someone else places on you. Right? So I can make you accountable for something. You need to choose to be responsible for that. Right? So this is, this is the context of responsibility that I will be using for the rest of the presentation. So it's the idea of accepting ownership, owning something. And that's responsibility comes from within. Now, back to the SDM. So 
this is a picture of a service. So we know that service is uh, a collection of a group of people organized in various social groups like teams, departments, areas that will take, uh, that will work together, they will collaboratively work to satisfy the need of someone and we know, we, we, we call that someone the customer, right? So that's how we define, we usually define services. And in the context of this, we know that there are two important times, two important points in time, right? So there is going to be a point where we make promises, what we call the commitment point, the I promise line. And then work happens in between and eventually comes out, and there is that, this other line called the delivery point, the here it is moment, right? So the service delivery manager role, just to, if you want to get it, at least my definition, or the definition that is, I think is where we usually align on is, well, the SDM is going to be the person or group of people, as I will discuss later, that assumes, takes full responsibility from the here, the I promise moment to the, the here it is moment. So that's, that's the span of responsibility that I take ownership of. And that defines the SDM as a role. Right? Now, what does that mean? That it means usually that you need to take responsibility for the delivery of outcomes. And that's usually what people tend to latch on the most. So, you know, we need to get the work done, right? That's, that's part of it. But the other part, and this is sometimes overlooked, is the improvement over time aspect. So services may not be fit or may not stay fit forever, somebody needs to take ownership of making them fit and, and, and making sure they, are, they stay fit over time, they improve. So, two aspects of that ownership, deliver the results and improvement over time, right? If one of these aspects is overlooked, then usually the role is not very effective. Now, in practical terms, what that means is that this service delivery manager needs to have the autonomy to set policy, right? So somehow decide how things are going to be done here. And this will happen within some organizational constraints, so depending on the constraints the organization places on you, you will have more or less autonomy or more or less space for that, but you need to have some autonomy to do that. And it will also be affected by the delegation style of the particular person playing the role, right? So um, I'm saying this because we would like to see scrum mass, uh, uh, delivery managers that are uh, you know, collaborative, that empower people and all that, but I don't see that as an inherent uh, or an essential element of the role. That's, that's more of a delegation style that has to do with the context that hopefully you're applying in a way that is congruent, right? So you may decide to play this role in a way that is very collaborative and empowering and, and assume a certain leadership position, or you may play the role in a way that is very autocratic and you make all the decisions and you tell everybody what to do, right? That's a delegation decision. Hopefully, it's connected to the organizational context and it's congruent. But I don't see this as, as necessarily a, um, an inherent definition of the role. Right? What, what I see as part of, that, of the role is that this autonomy to set policy. To say, well, this is how, it, how things are going to happen. And I will get into what that means in more details in a moment. Now, uh, there is some other aspect I'd like you to consider when thinking about how to understand the role. And so imagine that you are. Uh, living in one of various countries that are um, around the lake. So you have various kingdoms um, sharing this big lake in between. And, well, there is a you know, king and a queen for each of these places. And they all send their, their fishing ships to the lake to fish, to feed their populations. Okay? Now, um, hopefully these kings and queens eventually realize that if they if they just keep doing this over a, over a longer period of time, they may easily lead into a situation where they will enter into, into competition, right? Maybe even into conflict. Maybe uh, they will end up uh, depleting the fishery, for example. They will end up in this overfishing situation. They may end up using this collective resource they all have in a way that is not sustainable over time. So, you know, when they, they realize that this is happening, what they do is they hire a fleet commander. They hire the services of someone who they say, well, we're going to put you in charge, in command of the, our combined fleet, and we're going to acknowledge that you have the authority to um, make the decisions in a way that is fair for all of us, not equal necessarily, fair, right? There's politics always, right? But you know, the, you're going to make, we entrust you with the ability to make the decisions in a way that is fair for us and sustainable over time. And for, to do that, we sign a treaty. Okay? So the, the, the metaphor here is the idea that we have a group of people here that have realized that they are all sharing a common resource that is finite, that it needs to be sustainable over time because their livelihoods depends on that or their 
some, some, some aspect of their life depends on that. If they, if they are not careful, they end up with a situation where you know, a tragedy of commons of sorts ends up happening, and we all end up uh, having negative effects overall. So we just agree to collaborate. Right? So what we have here is the role of the SDM, or the SDM role as the trusted partner for various kings and queens. Right? So how does this metaphor apply to the word widow? So we have a service, and services very commonly have to satisfy the needs of multiple customers, right? especially if they are internal shared services. So this is the group of kings and queens that need to realize that they are all needing this common resource that could very easily get overloaded and overburdened if they are not careful, if they enter into, a, into an, a competition that is completely unmanaged. So the SDM plays the role of this trusted partner across this commitment point that all these kings and queens will acknowledge has the authority to manage this service in a way that is sustainable for all of them in the longer time. Okay? So two aspects to the role. The, the role we normally describe as, you know, well, we'll make sure we know how things are done between I promise and here it is, but it's also being or ad adopting this position of being the trusted partner of the various customers that are part of the service. Right? Now, um, in, in, in more concrete terms, I said earlier the, the SDM needs to have the autonomy to set policy. I'm referring to things like this. So there's going to be service interface policies, things like what are our work item types? How do we allocate capacities of service? Uh, how do we allocate work? What, what are our classes of service? How do we replenish? Uh, then once the work is inside the service, there's going to be workflow policies. So well, there's going to be some sort of workflow state for various work item types. There's going to be transition policies, definitions of done, definitions of ready. Uh, we're going to manage flow in particular ways, so this will be paying attention to delays and blockers and things like that. And eventually, well, we're going to deliver in some, in, in some ways. What's the delivery frequency, for example? The batch size, things like that. So an SDM needs to be in position to just set policies like this, and that would be the first part, taking responsibility. And again, this could be done in a way that is very autocratic. I say so, and this is how it's done. Or we do this by collaboration and getting everybody involved and delegating and blah, blah, blah. Okay? But the second aspect is all these people need to actually acknowledge the, the authority of this, of this SDM in doing so. Right? If that is not in place, that will start breaking. Um, I will briefly refer to the service request manager role that you are probably familiar with. I'm, we will not cover this too much in this presentation, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that there is also this other emerging role. Um, so, as I said earlier, services sometimes have, or very often have, multiple customers. And these customers may need a whole process just to come up with the requests. So it's not that I just show up at the door and just say, I want this. Well, there may be a whole process just to generate all those ideas and all these requests, get them ready. Um, so. Getting into this commitment decision may require a, an involved process. Well, customers may need help on that. That's the role of the SRM. So the SRM helps customers figure out and manage the, uh, or manage the flow of work towards the commitment point so that a, a replenishment decision can be made here. So I, I'm, I'm saying this because sometimes uh, there is the view that the, one of the, 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 S, the SRM is a proxy for customers. So SDMs make promises to customers, not to their proxies, <laughs> right? SRMs help these customers marshal their work and get their work ready, but promises are, the, the I promise moment here is between an SDM and a bunch of customers outside. Right? The SRM helps manage that upstream part of the process. Right? Um, now, um, okay, so let's say we agree that we're going to start looking at the SDM in this way. Uh, at some point, we may decide that this is something we would like to have, and we were going to introduce the role. Eventually, the question will be, well, how um, do we need to make a job description? How do we hire for this? I know that Dave and I were having, were having this conversation earlier over an internal chat. So there is something I'd like you to consider before even getting there, and it's the fact that uh, if you have a service that somehow works, right? So you have a service that is delivering, perhaps in a way that is not very fit, right? Perhaps not with lots of problems, but it's some, somehow work is getting in, somehow get it done, and somehow get going out. You may have the SDM already, right? 
based on the definitions I just gave you earlier, somebody must be accepting the work in and there is somebody deciding how the work gets done. So before deciding to introduce a new role, consider that it might be there, you just need to learn to see what you have, right? So I can give you something that might look like an algorithm perhaps to find in your SDM or what, what do you have there that may serve as a starting point for an SDM. And at least this is how I go about it. So if, I, if I'm looking at an organization and trying to figure this out, this is the steps I tend to follow. So you have a service and you have a commitment point and a delivery point. Start by asking what comes out. So can you identify a customer recognizable piece of value? And the, the important word here is customer recognizable, right? So things come out of services that sometimes are part of a larger thing that customer will recognize as a need they have, right? So I'm referring to those larger pieces, not the small ones. So in, in more concrete terms, so uh, sometimes services put out lots of little stories in production, but you need to have a bunch of those just to have something that customers will say, ah, that's what I need. So I'm referring to those, right? Larger customer recognizable items, not necessarily small individual delivery pieces. Anyway, so you find the work item type, then you can look upstream and find who asked for it, who said I need it, to identify who's the customer for that particular work item type. So you have the work item, you have the, the customer who requested that. Next step is, um, when did it cross the commitment point? So at some point, this ceased to be an option and became a commitment, a promise. When did that happen? And connected to that, next question, who said I promise? Because somehow it got in, right? <laughs> Who was that? Can you identify the person or group of people who accepted the work in? How did that happen? So once you have that, you have more or less a you know, clue who might be the delivery manager there already. Now there's the other question that comes after this important one. Is that person, the person who said I promise, is that person also accepting full responsibility for what happens after? From the moment of I promise to the moment of here it is. If you can get the answer to those two questions, then you find your SDM. Now, the title of this person may not be SDM. This person may not see themselves as an SDM, but they are effectively playing a role. They may be playing it in a way that is incomplete or even um, uh, dysfunctional. I will show you several examples of that later, but you have someone who is actually playing the role or attempting to play the role, right? Um, now, important thing to note, this is not about looking for titles and roles. There was nothing in this algorithm to say, look for people that is called like this or covers this particular job description. It's about these two things, making promises and managing delivery, taking, taking ownership after that. And uh, be aware of the fact that it may be in your current state dysfunction. So this doesn't necessarily indicate any particular level of maturity. It just says, well, you have someone attempting to do this or maybe doing it very well. And well, that will give you some capabilities. And then we can talk about how mature the situation is or not. But it's... Uh, uh, the, the point I, I want to draw your attention here is how first, you may have somebody already, so you don't, it's not that you need to go hire someone. Go first, look how it's happening today. Let's keep in mind that Kanban is a lot about um, a lens to see what's there already, right? Kanban is a way to see, says Andy Carmichael, right? Well, let's start seeing how we are managing delivery. That will give us a clue. All right. So I'd like to move on to some showing you some implementation patterns, uh, ways I've seen this role being implemented in, in real life. So this, uh, this, I, I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of things I've seen in various organizations. Um, uh, essentially, there are two categories here, places where the role is working in a way that is functional, let's say. It actually accomplishes the, the, its goals. It's, it's, it's allowing the service to actually um, function correctly and it's, it's not being a, a, a barrier to higher levels of maturity. So I, I will show you several examples on this green category on the left. It doesn't mean that they are all high maturity examples. Actually, some of them are very low maturity, but doesn't matter. It means that they have someone playing the role in a way that would allow higher levels of maturity to happen. The examples on the left, these are these functional implementations of this. So places where it's actually being a barrier, right? It's, if you, or when, when I've seen this taking place, this ends up being a problem to this group moving out of their lower levels of maturity into higher levels of capability, okay? Now, before I move on, would there be any questions so far? Feel free to just raise questions or concerns at any time. It's I will hijack you at the end of the, of the presentation, so you cannot go to the break anyways, so, <laughs> yes. 
So I wouldn't say your uh, um, algorithm has a bug, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> the challenge uh, from the practice is that often, depending on the business model of the client, those who accept uh, the request are far ahead upstream mm -hmm. somewhere and are not ESDM. But they are not, as your, to your question, they are not taking Correct. I actually will show you a couple of examples of that. The thing is, yeah. I would argue they are still the SDM. They don't see themselves as SDM, but they are. And I will get into an example that maybe addresses that. Now, uh, to that, to your point, actually, I will show you a bunch of patterns. These are, these, are, these are things I've seen. I would be interested first to see if you have seen them as well, or if you have seen some others, right? Or maybe you can point back, as Andreas has mentioned, right? Uh, and we could go into that discussion. I, I would argue that actually, yes, they are, that's the problem, right? They are actually not playing the role completely in a way that is fulfilling the two aspects. And because of that, that creates a problem of evolution. Now, you may have some other people down, downstream that is playing parts of it. So, yeah, hopefully I will address that in one of the examples. Yes? Yes. The scope of their Kanban system actually includes a whole bunch of smaller ones. And there's an SDM for the smaller Kanban system. Right. Uh, well, that's why I said let's start this with identifying uh, this customer recognizable thing. And we do, we do it at that level. Now, this big customer recognizable item may then split into smaller things. And then you may have partial areas of delivery. And then I don't have any example of that in the examples I have here, but I can see how that could create a set of other challenges, right? Maybe there's a separate pattern there that, that needs to be probably mine, right? But yeah, correct. Um, if, if that case happens, what I would be looking at, okay, who's managing the, the large stuff, right? And that's one, one aspect of the service. The fact that then it decomposes for, for flow management uh, reasons is a different concept. Anything else? All right, let's look at some examples. So this is what I would call the SDM at the front desk configuration. It's the typical canonical implementation, let's say. It's, it's so uh, again, this, these are really examples. I've obfuscated the names and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, you know, the service names just so to protect the innocent. But, uh, but these, are, these are real things, real examples I've seen in companies, in organizations. So in this case, you have a public website team, so small team with a team lead, let's call her Mary. They take care of uh, managing the public side of a website for marketing teams and some development teams, and they do things like content updates, new pages, fixes. So um, very small team. Mary is the person who is recognized by all these people as the entry point to this. So if I need something changed in the public website, I know I need to talk to Mary. Right? And Mary has a process to accept requests. So she's doing some of the upstream. So they have a very small simple upstream where they receive requests, they need to classify them, they need to um, prioritize them. Eventually, a commitment is made. In this case, uh, well, Mary makes a commitment. He, she says, well, I think we can do this. Yes, we do it, right? And then she goes to the team. So it's, she's playing it in a, in a more autocratic way, let's say, right? But the team is fine with that, and the work gets done and eventually gets delivered, right? So very simple, small example, but it's, uh, there are other, um, titles you may see associated with a pattern like this. And this can be played in different ways. So for example, in a scrum team, in a, you know, small scrum team running a, a, a shared service, for example. Well, the, uh, the product owner or the scrum masters could be the one playing the role, and they are doing this in a way that is collaborative. So when, uh, for example, uh, replenishment decisions are made, well, the team gets a say, and we only commit if the team is committed, blah, blah, blah. So there is a system to do that that acknowledges team participation, for example. But the point is there is a system for that. <laughs> there is a process, there is a policy. Now, um, an, an interesting thing to notice here, and when I see this in, uh, in, in small scrum teams, it's not uncommon that the product owner is playing the SDM role. So again, if you go back to what I said earlier, how you define the role, right, is accepting responsibility from commitment to delivery, and, and managing everything that happens in between, it's not uncommon that I see POs doing that, not Scrum Masters. Uh, actually, it's, it's the minority of the cases is where Scrum Masters actually do that, right? And in those cases, the PO then ends, is, is usually just a BA that writes stories and updates Jira, right? But in most of the cases, that's not the case. Product owners tend to play the, 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 the SDM role in, in those situations, right? Product owners, uh, 
product managers, team managers, so the titles will vary. Um, this is another example, the SDN by committee. So in this case, what you have is an application development platform, uh, an application platform development service, multiple teams working on a larger application. They do updates and projects and things like that. They work for various business lines. There are several POs here, so there is for example, a couple of POs, a team lead, uh, a project manager. So what's important here is that all these people here are the ones accepting responsibility for the work and managing delivery at the end, but they do it as a group. So it's a committee playing the role. So the, the SDM role sometimes is a person, sometimes it's a group. Now, what happens when it's a group? There is a challenge there, and the challenge is that everybody in the group needs to see each other as co-responsible for the whole thing, right? So. Uh, Rob, for example, may be accepting or maybe uh, helping, you know, getting some work done for this uh, digital channel VP. Eventually, the commitment is made, we do the project, but everybody else knows that we made that commitment. Robert made a commitment, but that means we are committed as well, right? So that's the challenge, that we see all the work as our work, regardless of which channel it enter from, enter from okay? So uh, collective ownership is the, is the challenge here, collective collective responsibility. For this to work, you need to get that situation where they, they all see themselves as, you know, if, if, if Rob makes a promise, it's the same as if I were making a promise. Now, uh, the other part of this is that everybody here needs to understand that this group here is the entry point. They all acknowledge that, you know, this is the, this is the way we talk to this service and, uh, you know, we, we, we acknowledge the fact that they are our trusted partners. Uh, so, a con a, a, an environment, an initial environment of high trust is highly necessary for this to work. Right? But you know, the, the point here between this slide and the previous one is you can have the role play by a single individual or by a group of individuals. But if that happens, they need to play as if they were one. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the, the catch. Now, this is another case. Uh, imagine you have a well, project delivery service. This could be an IT department or a... Um, development department, there is a, an, uh, a director that is in charge of this group, so Karen has a bench of people, so a group of people who she can assign to various projects, forming various teams. So some of these teams are long-lived, they are stable, some of them are formed for a project and then disbanded, sometimes people move from team to team, so Karen balances workload. The point here is that you have a person that has uh, a group of people and some they manage that by building different social groups. But, you know, the entry point is Karen. So same thing we've said before. There is an entry point that is very clear. There is a person who accepts full responsibility of what happens after. Uh, but in this case, well, it's, it has direct authority over multiple groups of people. Right? So everybody here reports to Karen. There may be some PMs and Scrum Masters here that manage, and this may cover the case that Dave uh, was referring earlier. So, well, there's going to be intermediate points that we need to commit you know, to larger project, and then we commit to phases, and maybe that's delegated to these people. But at this level, at the level of these work item types, well, Karen is the one taking responsibility end to end, and she's fully involved here. She may not be running the projects day to day. That's delegated to PMs and Scrum Masters, right? But she's still heavily involved in setting policy. So, uh, in this case, the SDM is somebody who will carry titles like the VP of such and such, or the CTO, or the CEO even for a smaller organization. So, it's, uh, they have authority over a large group of people, but they manage that as a, as a, as a single service. Um, uh, oops, nope. Now, uh, this is an example of the uh, SRM SDM in tandem. So, if you, if you attend a, a, a KMP class, for example, and you hear about these roles, well, the description essentially describes this situation, where you have something like, uh, in this case, was a, a digital financial product service with a couple of teams. These teams are managed by a Scrum Master, and the Scrum Master takes care of everything that happens after the commitment point, up to delivery. But there is a significant work that needs to happen upstream. So this is the case where you, know, you will have a group of BAs, for example, and, and um, um, customer experience people working in, in, in the upstream. Well, and there is a uh, an, an SRM, in this case, is a product manager who takes care mostly of the upstream work and talking to the, all, the, all the other stakeholders. And, but he works, Rob and Mario work very closely, right? So they are sharing the roles. This is another case of a, um, an SDM run, an SDM role played by multiple people. In this case, you have, well, not the SDM role, sorry, you have a combination of two people, right? An, S, an, S, an, uh, an SDM on one side of the commitment point, an SRM on the other side, but they are working in a coordinated fashion, right? 
But the uh, important thing here is Rob acknowledges the fact that Mario will manage end-to-end. -end. Mario acknowledges that they are working for these business lines through Rob. Right? Rob manages part of this upstream. There is obviously involvement of the, of the in this case, this, this scrum master in, 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 in the upstream portion of the workflow, but they work together. Right? So canonical implementation of the two roles. And well, these are common titles you see, product owners, product managers, product directors playing the SRM role, team leads, project managers, development managers, scrum masters playing the, um, the SDM role. Right? So um, what's common, what's uncommon, or what's, what's not so common about all these examples I just showed you? What's, what do they have in common? Or what's, let's tell you what's different. Let me tell you what's something what, that is definitely different. It's not about their titles, right? So they have very, very different titles. Scale is different. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah, uh-huh. Scale is different. What else? What else may be different? Right, so in some cases you will have, um, so every, every system, every service will have some form of upstream, right? So work needs to somehow arrive and get ready for commitment. The thing is not always you have the need of uh, an elaborate upstream process and may not um, be worth having a separate role for that, correct? Um, scale of work items. Scale of work items. What about maturity? So I have said nothing, or I haven't said much about the, the, the maturity of all these various groups. They were various, various levels of maturity, right? So uh, you could argue that this one, where is, where is Mary, here? This was for probably level zero or level one at most, right? Right, may vary, may vary. But the thing is, you could also have, for example, level zero here or here, right? So uh, this is not to indicate that something like this will be more mature than something like that, right? So that's not what they have in common. So um, what, do they, what they have in common is the fact that, you know, in, in all these cases, you have a very clear acknowledgement for, from the customers of where the entry point is and who's managing this. So if I want service from this service, I talk to these people or group of people. But the other part is the second part. And that's, if I were to say that what's the most common aspect I find missing when we work with different organizations is this, is this side. Right? Somebody makes a promise, but they're not involved in what follows after. And that's going to be the common thing you will see in all the patterns that I'm going to mention later, which are the dysfunctional patterns. How are we doing with time? Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, so let's do. Uh, uh, this is the other thing they do have in common, by the way, is they have all avoided the main barrier to higher maturity. So they may be in lower maturity levels, but because they have somebody taking care of and taking responsibility of the service end to end, they have opened the door for higher, higher levels of maturity. Of course, there are other barriers. It's not that just by having this you have guarantee your evolution, right? <laughs> But at the very least, you have removed the one that, at least in my experience, is the most significant one. Right? Of all the other maturity, uh, maturity um, level two barriers, this is the one that tends to be the most constraining, in my opinion, in, in my experience. Because without this, you cannot really fix any of the others. Right? All right, so let's take a look at a couple of uh, examples of these functional SDM implementations. So the SDM in denial would be the, the let's say, the, the, the baseline for all of them, or the, the case where you know, all the others derived from. And is the case, uh, in, in this example, for, uh, you have uh, an application development service, let's call the PO, Jane, so the, they were following some form of Scrum, although there was one Scrum master for two teams, but anyways, so you have uh, a bunch of teams here managed by Dave, and there is Jane as a PO. So uh, Jane is, you know, to be fair with her, she's running part of the upstream process, she's making promises to customers. Um, so if you ask the first question, who said I promise? Well, that's clearly that that was Jane, right? But remember, there was another question after this. Who's, who's taking ownership after? And she would fail that question, right? So her assumption was that I make a promise, and after this, well, Dave will take care of it, right? So uh, in this case, and I think that was, I think it was uh, uh, Andrea's question, somebody upstream is saying I promise, but they are not taking the second part. Well, that, I call that the SDM on denial pattern, right? So 
I, I would argue that Jane is the SDM, is just is not playing the role fully. And no, it's not only that, it's her assumption of, well, they will take care of it, doesn't take into account the fact that there is very limited delegated authority to Dave, right? So Dave cannot really make policies here, right? So if Dave decides to change, for example, the way we actually let the work flow or let the work enter, so Dave does, has no say on the replenishment policy, which results in pushing all the time, right? Uh, he has no say in how we're going to deploy here at the end, right? He has no say on, you know, work just showing up and being given a higher class of service for no apparent reason, <coughs> right? So he has no much authority to do much here, so... But the thing is, Jane would. Jane is in a position to actually do that. She's just conscious, or unconsciously perhaps, not doing it, right? <laughs> but it's playing one, but it's at the same time, it's playing part of the role, the I promise part, but not the I am responsible part, so... Now, in, in a situation like this, for example, uh, I, I've seen cases of people saying, well, we need to go hire an SDM. Well, there's another option. You can just talk to Jane and see if she wants to play the role fully, right? <laughs> Before hiring another Dave, because if you, if you just you know, hire an SDM that ends up being like Dave, they will go nowhere anyways. You end up with the same pattern, right? Why? Well, because really the SDM is Jane. Who's saying I promise? That's the important question. Yes? Um, some scaling was mentioned. Um, uh, would that require that you have kind of a hierarchy of, which I've seen actually, hierarchy of SDMs? i give you an example. An account team in Shanghai is selling something mm -hmm. to a client, like at Nike. Um, would you like to use our order management and transport shoes from Asia to Europe? They do it, and then they promise. <laughs> They make the promises exactly as you described, mm -hmm. and they have a list of those promises, and they sign the contract, and they celebrate champagne, and like three months later, this list arrived <laughs> at Jane's table, <laughs> and she's like, <gasps> um, <laughs> right? All these promises have been made. Now you need someone again to promise things in chunks. So I see in that case, right, but that's, nobody that's a, is aware who is the SDM in that right, context. Right, but this, that's a promise that needs to be now fulfilled in the context of another promise that is maybe uh, unfulfillable, right? Yeah, so, so you will, a, will a hierarchy up, of promises. Yes, but uh, so let's, let's answer the question in two parts. Yeah. In terms of hierarchy, sure, you may end up with hierarchies. That doesn't, tell, that doesn't turn this functional situation into functional. No, no not the functional hierarchy, but like an SDM hierarchy of... Uh, those promise to the customer directly, well, yeah. mm -hmm. you need to debunk it, and then you Yeah, go ahead. and it can happen that, for example, we, I can promise a project here, and then the project is, uh, uh, is, is going to be delivered in phases, and somebody needs to manage that, and that may be a commitment I do after, and there is some, so you end up with a group of people. I, I would put that into the category of the, uh, of the, um, the SDM in committee that I, I, I mentioned earlier. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the, the the hierarchy is of they are at the same level or different levels. The, the important thing in my mind is that they are working in a coordinated fashion and they acknowledge their, their mutual commitments. My commitment is your commitment, right? So I committed to this phase, which means that you probably shouldn't be committing to the next project, right? Mm -hmm. Right? In the same way, I committed to this project, please don't split this into 20 phases that will take 20 years because, you know, <laughs> or do it in a way that, you know, will allow us to fulfill the other projects we have. So it, the question to me is not as much of a hierarchy, that's, that's going to be highly dependent on the context you're in, what the organization situation is, well, but whether they're working the in a coordinated word, fashion. A sequence, maybe a sequence would be a better wording, I guess, of commitments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you will end up with this sequence because one commitment then is split into multiple lower level commitments. All right. So this example you have here is a degenerate version of the SCDM by committee example. So it's, you have a group of people, again, uh, that they are all managing different aspects of the development of this service. The problem is they are working in an uncoordinated fashion, right? So they are, they are attempting to be an SDM by committee, but because they are not talking to each other much, or actually there is a more uh, problematic assumption, is the assumption that the, all the capacity is really mine, right? <laughs> or at least, it's not, if not all, most of it, right? So I remember the, the, this product director here, he would acknowledge the fact that the service is working on other things. Right? We are doing, for example, platform upgrades, which 
mostly comes to technology through these other IT directors. So we know we do that. And yes, we need to reserve capacity for that. But when I'm doing my own planning here, I don't really take it into account, right? So the underlying assumption is I own the whole thing. Yes, there is some other things that will get done. So the, 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 the problem here is not the fact that there are many of them, it's that they're uncoordinated. And it's not that, for example, this technology VP acknowledges the fact that the business managers will be also consuming the capacity of the service through Mike, through this other PO, okay? So uh, it's, it's not that they are um, acknowledging that we have, in this case, a trusted set of partners that they are all equally, or more or less equal in their say on how the, the service is going to be accessed. So that ends up creating this dysfunctional situation where work is pushed and you end up with a heavy overfishing situation. Right? Work is just pushed inside and the team is overloaded and things start breaking in the scenes. Right? So you end up having too many SDMs in that kitchen because they're working in an uncoordinated fashion. And the final example I want to share with you today was this case where on the surface it looks like the first one I show you. You have a service with a SDM that is talking to customers, making commitments, managing end-to-end. -end. But if you look closely, you will find that there are some customers that found the back door. They don't talk to the product manager in this case. They talk to a dev lead. And this is how they get some work in. So you have a group of people who are not acknowledging that this is the entry point to the service. They just go through the back door. Right? The result of that is, again, the service gets overloaded. There is also another, uh, in this particular team, there was uh, another source of work that came from within. So this, uh, this is, I, I see this happening very commonly for technical work, you know, technical debt repayment, uh, refactorings, platform upgrades, and things like that, that the teams feel they need to do for technical reasons. So there's a very good reason to do that work. The thing is, uh, in this case, the team was deciding those to, to initiate that work autonomously without actually talking to this PO, right? So suddenly you have all this source of work that is not even acknowledged, it comes from within, and Overall, it ends up disrupting work. It ends up delaying other work. Uh, you, you end up with a fight between the PO and the team because you know who has more. The, the one who, who, who screams the highest gets the work done. So some some days will be the architect, some days will be the business lines. Right. So so in this case, the problem is that uh, the the um, the, ent the entry point to the service to making commitments. Is, is, is the rule that in this case is broken. Right? So if there are some things you're committing to that don't go through this or explicitly through this line, they cross it through the back, through the back door. All right, um, so uh, to quickly wrap up, we started by asking why is it's important to talk about the SDM role and uh, my answer to that was, well, it's important because it's a, it's a significant barrier to higher levels of maturity. And being an SDM means taking responsibility. What's that? Well, it's about ownership and being a choice, choice of ownership. And well, that responsibility is about, uh, well, responsibility for delivery and improvement and being the, the trusted partner for your customers. Then we talked about how to find these SDMs because probably, or I would argue that most likely you have them already in a way perhaps that is dysfunctional, but it's, it's there already. So look for who said I promise and whether there's, there's responsibility after that. That will, that will give you a clue where to start looking or perhaps what to improve. And finally, we talked about different uh, patterns, some of them more dysfunctional than others. So uh, learn to see them and identify them and see how you can work from there and, and, and to improve the situation. Again, I would be very interested to know more patterns. So Andres has brought up this. Well, we may need to codify this problem of multiple levels. So how, how exactly that happens? Uh, well, would there be any others? Right? Uh, to learn more about this, as I was preparing for this talk, I took some notes and I uploaded them to our website in the form of a small article. So there is some material that is here. My colleague, Alexi, who is sitting right there, wrote another article about how to hire for the SDM. So that's a very common question. You know, we need to hire SDMs. Uh, how do you write a, a job description? Well, it's not as simple <laughs> as, as I hope you, you, you also get from this talk. It's, uh, it's, it's not about writing a detailed list of things. Well, Alexi also has some ideas that you can check there. And with that, that's all I had for you today. I hope this was useful. And 
let's open the door for questions. I think we still have a few minutes. Five minutes, and whichever means you want to cut off from your break, <laughs> because I can stay. Ready? But that's that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Would there be any other questions or comments? Yes, please. So uh, a pattern that I sometimes see is um, an SDM who, who wants to be a, a responsible but somehow gives up and gets run over by the business. So it's not like they're going around him like you, mm -hmm. you said in the partial gatekeeper, but they just don't think they have any authority to say no. Yep. Um, so that was the case, or that would actually fall into this one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in denial. Yeah. yeah, because the, so the problem here was that they wanted to do more. He just couldn't because he had very limited authority delegated to him. Not just, in this case, they didn't report to Jane, right? So that was another problem in this organization, this, you know, matrix that ended up with weird, uh, it's still a leaky gate. Yeah, you know, right? a, a weird line of delegation. So Dave reports to some manager over here who is not delegating anything because this manager doesn't have any authority over Jane. Jane is doing a, so. <laughs> so uh, uh, I would still fit it into this pattern where you have an SDM that is not acknowledging their role. Because you know, there is something else that could happen here if, if Jane acknowledged the fact that she's actually managing the whole thing, she could decide to, to delegate things to Dave, right? And, and give space for Dave to actually do more stuff, but she wasn't. Right? argue that the multi-level pattern that several people brought up here, it's basically this pattern scaled, except uh, you just have to replace Dave with uh, a second level manager, third level manager, or with a community of practice of some team leads of Scrum Masters um, who just basically have to get the work done mm -hmm. um, on the I promise on the promise made on their behalf without taking responsibility. So basically, the thing is, like David Anderson spoke about how things scale, right? And um, avoid making mistakes because mistakes scale even better than the good stuff. I mean, and this is one of the mistakes that scales, <laughs> dysfunction scales too. Right. <laughs> They're scared for him, yes. What else? Yes, Dave. Uh, I don't know, I'm just paraphrasing. One of the things that's common about these dysfunctions is that they're asymmetric commitments, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the, all the parties are not there making the promise to go. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're push. And you can make asymmetric commitments when you have push. Right. Um, yes. The the if you mean, but all these people weren't involved in the commitment. Yes. Well, both all of the all of the dysfunctions have mm -hmm. a push model yep. because there's an asymmetry to the commitments. Yes. So if you have mm. if you discover asymmetric commitment, you have probably found an SDM dysfunction. Yeah. Um, I would agree, however, at the same time, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm kind of hesitating is because I also see that as a matter of um, delegation style, okay? Um, the, I mean, if I, if I just put Jane on this side of the commitment point, right, as, as it actually is, because she sees herself on the other side. I, I don't, I, actually, that was a very common thing. I don't make promises, the team makes promises, right? Because, you know, but we, we bring this into, planning meetings and, you know, team, I need a commitment from you. By the way, I already promised this like three months ago, but, you know, I need a commitment from you. Can we do this type of thing, yeah. right? So uh, if you place this sticky on this side, what, what I'm thinking is, is this really, is, is the commitment asymmetric, right? Because you have, or asynchronous, because you have the customer on one side and the, other, and the service on the other side, there is a handshake, right? So that, from that perspective, is... Um, but it's on the, is, she's on the wrong side of the commitment line for the service. This is how she perceives herself, okay. but the reality is I, I would put her here, right? Right, but a service delivery manager manages from the point of commitment to the here it is, I promise, to here it is. Yeah. Right? And she's on the other side of... 
is she? Because she's well, actually like saying, I promise, her. right? So that, you draw her as honest? Right, I, I know, because this is the perception, right? So if you, if you were to draw the system as, is, as, as, is, as, as you see it, it looks like that. But the fact that you can't answer this second question, sorry, the, 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 the fact that she's saying, I promise, is puts her on this side, at, at least in my, in my view, puts her in that side of the line, right? So, but yeah, but I understand what you're saying. So there is a commitment that is made without the acknowledgement of all these other people. Alexi right? said many times, when we see this asymmetric commitment pattern, the commitments are not being made with Dave. They're may being made in a different room at a different right. time yeah, yeah, by exactly. somebody else. Yeah, in this case, Jane is making the commitment yeah. months ago to a different group of people and then coming to the team saying, I need a commitment from you. The Can you do this? The commitment <laughs> didn't happen in the replenishment meeting between Jane and Dave, yeah. which is where the commitment line is. Yeah. It happened mm -hmm. weeks or days earlier in a different yeah. room with different people. Cool. Jane, Jane's saying, uh, hey, you guys decide what to do, but I've also committed to this, so do this really. Well, yeah. I don't care what you're doing now. Yeah. I just made a promise. Figure it yeah. out. <laughs> it's already done. So the, the I promise moment already happened. The, the, the dysfunctional aspect is there is no, there is no management after that. There is no, but so there is no responsibility of management. It's just assume that they will take care of it. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, last question. Last question. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you didn't. Um, I mean, do you have thoughts on the SDM's responsibilities for managing the service? We've talked a lot about mm -hmm. managing the commitment point. Uh, yes. Not, uh, you, you, you alluded to it with like setting policies, but. Well, that's, that's how I, s I see the management aspect is by setting all these policies. Now, uh, let's go back. Where is that? It was at some point mirror. <laughs> 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 So, so I, I, as an SDM, I will manage this service by setting up things, policies like that, right? So now, obviously, policies need to be enacted and, and they need to be executed day to day, right? So that comes back to this idea of delegation style I mentioned earlier, right? So I could do this in such a way that it involves me in every single decision, right? So we, you, you will not, we will not make any promise until, un, unless I'm in the room and I say I promise, or I could go all the other way and say this, this is the framework I used to make decisions, you use it, and I delegate that on you, right? So the day-to-day -day may happen in very, or I have seen happening in very, very different ways. Same thing with, for example, definitions of done and definitions of ready. I could just say, well, our definition of done goes like this, and this is what we need to do in order to deliver something, or I could tell a team, you need a definition of done, go figure it out, tell me, and I will give you my approval, my approval after, or even something even more, uh, more um, delegated to a, a, to a higher degree, where the teams makes all the decisions because I empower them to do that. Uh, that has to do, I think, more with, again, organizational context, the level of maturity of the group, um, the level of competence of the group. So if, if, if the group doesn't have the skills to do this, I, I delegate this stuff to them, they're going to go in who knows which directions, right? So uh, these, these policies could be enacted and enforced in various ways. Some of them will require this SDM to take more active role. Some of them will take a more hands-off role, depending on the context and depending on the style of the person. And by the way, I, I suppose that opens another dimension, which is you could do that in a way, again, that is dysfunctional or functional, right? Because I could decide to delegate everything to a group that has no competence, for example, and the result is going to be erratic behavior. Huh? So. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is going to solve about every single blue sticky uh, uh, you see on the screen right now. It's, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of depth to it. Um, and we're talking about just one level transition. Right. Well, uh, that could be an input to the setting on all this, right? Mm 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you have to do it to do this, but knowing that they're healthy metrics or clean data, as we heard, you, know, you have to treat data with a little bit of suspicion sometimes. Right. So that's the whole, another role. Whoever is I wonder if that's connected more to maturity level as well, right? So in a lower maturity level, you may set up, for example, your delivery frequency and your batch size just based on superstition. Yeah. As you get more mature, this, this decision will be informed by data. And that means that you have to monitor your, your performance. So, so maybe, maybe I, that's how I would look at it. That's a maturity difference rather than a description of you need to do these things. And that comes back to the discussion we were having earlier, right? <laughs> Should we be more prescriptive or not? Well, I'm not sure. Right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. For Thank coming. you very much.